out emergency declaration to increase the reduction from normal citywide water use from 25 to 35 percent. Thank you, Mr. Hagmark. Madam Mayor, <clears throat> Council Members, Joshua Hagmark, Water Resources Manager. A um, little different presentation for you today. Uh, we are, I um, feel like we've gone through what, what is, will be our rainy season and feel like uh, it's time to, to step up the game. And uh, so today's presentation is a little different than our monthly discussions about our water supplies. Uh, we will be touching on our drought condition, recapping on that, uh, our water, current water supply strategy. But then we're going to dive into demand management strategy, looking at uh, phased water use regulations and also um, water demand for development projects, and then finishing with our recommendation. So to recap, uh, the state drought was declared in 2014, January 2014. Uh, the city moved under voluntary, uh, voluntary reduction in February 2014, subsequently in May, moving to a mandatory reduction of 20%, and then uh, last May declaring uh, a stage three drought declaration with a 25% mandatory reduction. <coughs> <clears throat> so this year, uh, we finished rainfall for Gibraltar at uh, just over 50% of normal, and uh, a little better at Kachuma, um, and at 67% for uh, downtown Santa Barbara. Again, uh, we did not see any significant runoff into our local reservoirs. It has not changed or improved our situation in that stance, and we do not anticipate any additional rainfall for the rest of this water year, which ends in September. I have a few pictures here for you. This is the intake tower that diverts water from Lake Kachuma to the south coast, uh, typically by gravity. And it currently, uh, this tower is, a, I believe it's about 100 feet tall, and it sits um, high and dry right now as we pump water out of the lake uh, to this very critical facility. And then here's almost 180 degrees from that picture. Uh, you see the barge. Um, where I took this picture, I'm, I would be under about 70 feet of water if uh, the lake uh, was full. Just giving a perspective. Uh, this barge is currently uh, in, the, in the process of being moved to a different location. You can see how close it is right now to the shore. You pretty much could walk out to the barge. Um, and so they're going to be relocating this barge and hopefully have that done by uh, mid-June. So one of the things that uh, we obviously keep tracking with this drought is the severity of it and just, I think, kind of um, really drives home. This is 97 years of rainfall records. This is now the driest five years on record, uh, surpassing what was our drought of record, the 1947 to 51, which was the basis of all of our water supply planning. Uh, this, this drought is almost 12 inches drier over that five-year period. It's a significant difference. Um, we would expect during a five-year average to receive 132 inches, and we received 60. Um, fairly dramatic, and certainly, as we've been talking about, a game-changer when it comes to our long-term water supply planning. Uh, as much uh, media sensation we heard about El Nino, and it's uh, certainly did bring some uh, welcomed water to Northern California. There's certainly a, a significant chunk of California that is still um, under the, the blanket of the drought, and uh, we are in the heart of that area, unfortunately. Um, and I'll be talking a little bit more about how Northern California's rainfall has changed the, changed the field. Um, Included this graphic, this is, shows the city's water usage going back to 1985. And one of the things I wanted to kind of point out is here was the last drought that we went through. And for those who were around, um, it was a pretty significant drought for this area. Uh, certainly not as drastic as this drought, but uh, we were, I would say we weren't as prepared. And we had an outdoor watering moratorium. We had uh, stopped all development. And we're currently uh, almost to that point. And this is a community that has a modestly added about 5,000 uh, residents to our community since the last drought. And yet our water usage is already down to that same level. But we've done it through 
pretty much voluntary means to the community. Our current regulations are pretty light. Uh, certainly there's a lot of regulations out there we could be doing, but um, this just speaks volumes, I think, to where this community's mindset has been about conservation and taking responsibility. And, you know, my favorite part in talking with people in the community is everybody is approaching this in a different way. Some people have forego showers because they want to water precious landscape. Some have let the landscaping go because they have certain other things they want to keep. And so everyone is making those trade-offs. And I think that's what's been uh, helpful and um, positive. There's a highlight to this drought is that everyone is doing uh, doing their part in their own way, and it's as a community we are achieving significant progress. And really today is all about recognizing that progress and just raising our target to match what the community is already doing. So our water supply strategy, just wanted to refresh where we are. We are in year five, 2016. Uh, we do have adequate supplies to get us through this year, and we have planned supplies to get us through next year. Uh, Desal is going to play a very significant role in making sure this community has adequate water, uh, as you can see here. Um, and then we are planning already for what would happen in 2018, and we have identified a, a, a shortage. And we feel um, in the last couple weeks we have secured adequate supplies now to fulfill that shortage, the question then becomes making sure we can get that water here. And I'll talk a little bit about the conveyance challenges ahead. Um, conservation, 40% uh, reduction for the month of March. It's just really impressive. And again, another um, positive sign in the community that we've, we've got the message. Um, our cumulative average now is 34% savings since declaring a stage three last May. I think this is uh, fantastic given very light regulations we have in play right now. Um, so our water supply strategy uh, moving forward has been to ensure adequate supplies to meet demands through 2018. And the key to that is that really is the planning horizon we feel is necessary to delay the desal decision uh, for any type of expansion for another year. Um, the tools that we are using is our supply management, which is our imported water, and then demand management, which is our conservation efforts. Uh, so just a little bit of information about our supplemental water purchase that we're wrapping up right now. Um, but before I get into that, let's talk about the conveyance limitation. I'm going to dive more into this uh, in May when we come back again, but uh, the state water system has been a very valuable asset. We have been taking full advantage of it during this drought, and we have imported over a year's worth of water to this community, but it does have a limitation as to how much water we can bring in. You know, Northern California received significant rainfall. We could buy more water, but we can't get it here. Uh, so we do have those limitations, and we're, we're bumping up against uh, significant evaporate, uh, evaporation when water is introduced into Kachuma now, that, that that water gets, in essence, taxed with the entire evaporation of the lake. And so it, it, it's getting very challenging um, wrestling with, you know, we have this significant amount of water. How do we get it here? And certainly if others aren't taking advantage of that capacity in the pipeline, we're, we're there and, and ready to step up and do that. But um, so the, the current proposal that we're purchased that we're working with is a, again, it's a um, almost a lease, but I think a more favorable lease this time around. But it's 4,000 acre feet of water, $250 an acre foot, roughly a million dollars for that. Two to one return water. For every two acre feet we borrow, we have to return one, which has been uh, a better deal than we've seen in the past, which has more been on a one to one. Uh, we have to return that water in 10 years. This brings our water debt up to about seven, a little over 7,000 acre feet of water that we need to return, which is over a year's, a half a year's worth of city water. So it's a pretty significant debt that we've incurred, and, and we're going to have to be focused on how to find water, buying it, and returning it to, to uh, AVEC. This water is already south of the Delta, so is isn't subject to conveyance losses, and we feel fairly confident about the ability to deliver it. On the demand management side of it, um, we are recommending increasing the target to 
again, this is matching the current community conservation efforts. This isn't asking really for more. This is asking for more of, I guess, the same. Um, it represents approximately 5,000 acre feet of savings annually. Keep that in mind because we're going to be going through uh, several different uh, options that the, that we did look at, and um, but this this is a, a significant savings right off the bat, and we d are not uh, recommending any additional regulations at this time. So, what triggers additional regulations? Um, certainly, interruptions in supplies. If we were to lose an enormous amount of wells or to go out, there were to be some interruption coming from Kachuma, uh, some state water interruption. That would obviously trigger us moving forward with additional regulations. Uh, also, the shortages. As I mentioned, the conveyance capacity limitation. Um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to get close this summer with demands, demands peaking in July, August, and September, being able to import and deliver enough water. Uh, we're going to be watching that closely and, and keeping the council uh, up to speed on this. But um, we're hopeful that we can get through this summer without implementing any short-term reductions. Uh, state regulations, uh, current conservation standards for the city are 12%. Uh, certainly, we're far above that, and the uh, state right now is not contemplating any uh, new regulations, and uh, I'd have to just comment on the fact that it was, it was in one way, it was nice having a state that was united behind the drought, and now we have basically two different states, the haves and the have-nots, and so it's, it's kind of made this, the dialogue at the state level a little more interesting and challenging, I think, because uh, there, are, there are communities and agencies that have plenty of water now. So potential water use regulations, uh, we did uh, provide this information last year and went over it. This kind of refreshed it. Um, and basically, there's, we see three different levels. And again, within these levels, there's varying degrees of what we can do. But prohibiting watering of lawns with exceptions potentially to schools, uh, venues, commercial venues where it's important to their commerce. But rough estimates at this point, given the conservation we've already seen from the community, we think we could eke out another 600 to 1,000 acre feet of savings annually if we moved, uh, if we had implemented a um, prohibition on that. Prohibiting outdoor water use except for hand watering of trees and shrubs, uh, somewhere between 1,200 and 1,600 acre feet of savings. And then prohibit prohibiting all outdoor water use somewhere between 16 and 2,000 acre feet of savings is what we anticipate we would see. Again, all of this comes with um, significant staffing and regulations and enforcement, and at this time, we don't believe that is necessary. So at this time, we're going to turn it over to Mr. Busk to walk through the development and the impacts of those developments. Thank you, council members. My name is Allison DeBusk, and I'm a planner in the Community Development Department. And as Mr. Hagmark said, I'm going to be talking about potential development, regulate or restrictions that we've talked about in the past, as well as the demand generated by development. Uh, we have heard concerns from the community about continued development during this um, extreme drought. And so we wanted to give you some current information and updated statistics um, compared to what we presented last year. So first, to give you an overview of uh, how much water we're talking about when we talk about development restrictions. The city's general plan estimates that we will have approximately 40 acre feet per year of new water demand from development, and that's based on the policies and land uses identified over the 20-year planning period of the general plan. We also looked at the certificates of occupancy that have been granted for development projects from 2004 through 2013, and that averaged to 28 acre feet per year. Um, there are big fluctuations each year, but we do think that that's um, a realistic average. And then to confirm those numbers, we looked at occupancies that have been granted in 2014 and found that 38.54 acre feet per year went online. And then in 2015, 9.74 acre feet uh, went online. And so as I said, this is typical of the unpredictable yearly fluctuations that we have, but it is still in line with the 10-year average of 28 acre feet per year. 
So using those estimates of 28 to 40 acre feet per year, that represents 0.29 to 0.41 percent of the city's drought water supply. And in doing these calculations, the drought water demand that we used was 9,800 acre feet per year. So the primary development restrictions that we've talked about in the past include a deferral of landscaping for development projects, whether that be voluntary or mandatory, suspension of building permits for new pools, and a suspension of building permits for projects with net new water demand. So starting with a landscape deferral, staff estimates that the savings from a landscape deferral would be approximately 4.44 acre feet per year. And just um, for the record, a lot of assumptions went into determining how much water savings we would get from this assumption or from a landscape deferral. Um, and in doing these calculations, we were only calculating purely aesthetic landscaping. So we're still assuming that the landscaping that's required as part of a project's compliance with stormwater management, um, any environmental restoration or mitigation that's required, and also landscaping required for erosion control, that that type of landscaping would still be allowed due to environmental concerns. So 4.44 acre feet per year equals 0.05% of the city's annual drought water supply. Another potential option for uh, reducing water demand would be a ban on permits for new pools. The city um, issues approximately 14 pool permits every year, and with the initial filling and then the annual maintenance, we estimate that that results in 1.2 acre feet per year of new water demand, which is 0.01% of the city's drought water supply. And another more significant tool for reducing new water demand would be to suspend the issuance of building permits for projects that result in net new water demand. So this would be generally projects that have new residential units or new non-residential square footage. It would not include additions to existing residential units. So looking at the big picture, we have approximately 69.64 acre feet per year of approved projects. We have 97.5 acre feet per year of pending development. And so that totals 167.14 acre feet per year of um, potential water demand in the pipeline. This equals 1.75% of the drought water supply. So as you can, oops, sorry. Mm -hmm. As you can see on this um, table, we've included numbers from 2014 and 2015, and you can see that generally the numbers are trending upward. We have about 33 acre feet per year more in the pipeline right now than we did at this time last year. Um, and I also want to be clear that this represents kind of the worst case scenario. This is everything that we have in the planning department right now. So we wouldn't expect all of this to come online within the next year or two years. It's just to give you the magnitude of all the development that's um, potential citywide. Um, as I had mentioned previously, we expect um, more like 28 to 40 acre feet per year to be an, the annual increase. We have a couple of questions, Mr. Dominguez and Mr. White. Uh, thank you. Um, there, in Santa Barbara doesn't have vacant land and probably doesn't have land that's uh, void of using water either. So is this net increase in water use or is this gross water use and that there was uh, past use that's not accounted for? Madam Mayor and Council Member White, this is net new water use and it's also, it's not compared to actual use on the site. It's compared to the water demand that would be on the site based on the city's water demand factors. So we didn't want to um, penalize properties that were perhaps using less than the typical demand or incentivize using more water on your site to bump up your existing water use. So it's um, across the board using the city's water demand factors. Yes. Mr. Dominguez? 
So this slide covers 2014 and 2015, and we're in 2016. Does this mean you have good news about projected rainfall for next year? <laughs> so I, actually, I should correct that. This is through um, March 1st, 2016. So that's when we pulled all the statistics together. And so the total for 2015 residential, that includes residential that was issued a certificate in calendar year 2015? Madam Mayor and Council Member Dominguez, this is projects that um, are in the pipeline that have not been issued building permits. So they're projects that are either pending, they haven't received any design review or other approvals, or the, the top row shows projects that have been approved. They've gotten their design review approval or their planning commission approval, whatever it may be. And so just to clarify, the numbers are not cumulative. Um, you know, for example, residential in 2014, we had 29.2 acre feet that had been approved. So As I guess what Mar I'm not understanding is so 2014, no building permit issued? Correct. What that means is we have not issued a building permit. So there's, they still have that approved status until they receive a building permit, at which point um, it goes under, into a different category. So what was, what was approved? The conceptual? The project itself was approved by either the Planning Commission or the Design Review Board. And then, then they didn't pull permits? Correct. They have not pulled permits yet. And then... Buildings that were actually built in 2014 or 2015, those would not be on this slide. Those correct. are already out of the pipeline. That's correct. And the next slide will actually get into that a little bit. So what isn't the pipeline? You mentioned that uh, the 2015 numbers are much bigger than 2014. And are the 2016 numbers with the AUD much bigger than that? So... Uh, Council Member Dominguez, these are numbers through March 1st, 2016, and I can't predict what they're going to be for the rest of the year. You know, we have had a few more applications come in in the month of April and that are not on this chart, but, um, you know, as I said, the, the numbers are trending upward, but we can't predict, you know, exactly what's going to walk in the door tomorrow. So I'm sorry, so you're including projects that came in January and February of 2016? That's correct. They're just lumped in with the 2015? That's correct. Okay. Mr. Russ? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Mr. Russ, um, these numbers are all potable water, and they include landscaping as well as other uses? Madam Mayor your... and Council Member Russ, that is correct. It includes all water use for the project. So if you, if you had, I mean, this is obviously not a significant amount of water in the, in the total scope of things, but if you had to break it down or do a deferred landscaping for the pending projects, you could have a different number. Council Member Russ, that is correct. We use a figure of approximately 50% as the amount of lands, water that goes towards landscaping for a project. And in some of, and I don't know that this is possible, but like in some of the larger pending hotel projects, for example, is non-potable available in terms of their landscaping use to them from our system? Council Member Rouse, it depends on their location. Uh, the larger projects, if, for example, the Waterfront Hotel, um, I believe that does have recycled water available to it for landscaping. Um, but some of the other uh, hotel projects are outside of the area of recycled water. Thank you. Okay, keep going. Thank you. So this slide identifies um, the amount of water demand based on building permits that have been issued. And so that's all permits that have been issued to, to until March 1st, and that's 75.32 acre feet per year. And so these are permits that have already been issued, and so uh, restriction on development would not affect this water demand. Go ahead, Mr. Dominguez. I'm sorry, can you give me the time span there again, please? So um, that is actually, it's everything from going back to 1990 until March 1st, 2016. Um, so there are some anomalies on that list of building permits issued. Um, some projects may have actually been occupied and they never called for their final inspection. So there's a couple of projects like that still hanging out there that might be older. But in general, these are projects that are um, still under construction. So Entrada would be part of that? That is correct. Okay. 
So the um, the slide previously showed 72 acre feet in 2014 and 67 in 2015. So the 75.32 number, that's just an annual number. That's not cumulative. Council Member Dominguez, that is actually cumulative of all building permits that have been issued but have not yet received occupancy. So then... I'm not sure that I understand the 72 and the 67 on the, the slide before because you obviously can't add those and get 75. So we're using a different um, system here. Council Member Dominguez, this slide does not include building permits that have been issued. So the slide that had, I think the 72 and 67 that you're referring to. Don't work. No, I think it's the two prior. I believe you're oh no one more let me come at it a different way then so the 75 acre feet from 1990 and 2016 is just slightly more than the acre footage we're going to get just from the 2014 projects council member Deming, is that that is correct if you um want to yeah look at it that way so 26 years worth of construction is about the same as one year of construction no in terms of the water required by those developments so we on average we issue 28 acre feet per year of new water um, from development projects the 75 of building permits that have been issued those are permits that have been issued you know primarily over the last three years you know there are some older ones but in general it's projects that have been issued recently but are still under construction so it's not necessarily true that this 75 acre feet per year will all go online this year. Some will be completed and will go online. Some will continue construction into next year and will be part of, you know, the next year's statistic on certificates of occupancy. Okay, I think I understand. So this is, when you say 1990, that's something could have been issued a permit, but for whatever reason, they sat on it for a couple decades. Mm -hmm. That's okay. correct. So it's not just all construction. Got it. Thank you. If, if you'd like to speak, you can spill out a, a public comment speaker slip and I'll call you up. So please continue. Okay, so in sum, looking at all the issued, approved, and pending projects, we have a total of 242.46 acre feet per year of new water demand, which is approximately 2.5% of the city's drought water supply. So at this time... Um, based on you know, prior council direction, staff is not recommending instituting new development restrictions. Um, during the last significant drought in the late 80s, we did implement some development restrictions, and I think it's helpful to compare the current situation to the drought at that time. So as you can see in this table, during the last drought, we had over 600 acre feet of new development in the pipeline, whereas currently we have 167 acre feet, which is significantly less. Also, at that time, the city as a whole was using 16,226 acre feet per year of water, and um, currently the city is using about 14,600 acre feet per year. And that's our pre-drought number, as you know. The city is currently using significantly less than that, but um, that's our pre-drought average. So in summary, um, staff does not know estimated water savings from a voluntary landscape deferral, but it would be less than a mandatory landscape deferral. From a mandatory landscape deferral, we would anticipate about 4.4 acre feet per year of water savings. A suspension of permits for new pools would be approximately 1.2 acre feet per year in savings. And a suspension of permits for new development would be approximately 28 to 40 acre feet per year of water savings. Thank you. Mr. Hotchkiss. Quick question, if I could. Uh, what, what is our acre footage uh, use now? About 11.5? Madam Mayor, Councilman Hodgkiss, it's about 9,800 acre feet a year. Thank you. I'm glad I. So, in summary, our water supply situation has not improved. Uh, we certainly are in unprecedented drought conditions. Uh, we are continuing to work to secure and preserve water supplies and promote extraordinary water conservation. 
and we believe increasing the citywide demand reduction target to 35% matching current community conservation is necessary. Uh, our recommendation is to adopt a resolution amending resolution 15036, the stage three drought emergency declaration to increase the conservation target from 25 to 35% of the 2013 water use. And we're here to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Why don't we go to public comment? Um, Frank DuPont, why don't you come on up, Mr. DuPont? And then Mark Kirkhart. And you have two, minute, two minutes here at the podium. It would be kind of simple. I'm just curious, do the people like the university and the people in the Goleta Valley areas uh, toward Costco, do they have to go through the same committee to get the building permits? And how long ago did some of those people probably get those permits authorized. Right. Well, Is that a, we'll ask that question right after public comment. Great. Thank you. Mr. Kirkhart. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor, members of the council. My name is Mark Kirkhart, founder of Design Arc Architects. I've been in business here for 40 years in the city of Santa Barbara this year. I employ uh, 20 people in my business right now. And I'm actually here not just speaking for my own self-interest, but actually for all of my clients all the other architects and everyone else in the building community in this in this city, and also the the trickle down effect that that building of the building community has on the on the uh, city, and I would just urge you to support the staff's recommendation to not impose any new restrictions. Um, I'd also would quote that many of you knew my my deceased partner Bruce Bartlett, uh, who had. I called him the person that probably had more common sense than anyone I knew, sat on the planning commission for eight years, as you know, with some of you guys. And he, his point was that why would you want to stop development, restrict development, because those projects are going to be the projects that will have the most water-wise development standards when they're built. So they will be the most water-conserving projects in the, pro in the city. So, you know, please don't uh, take those away from us. So that's, that's my, my comments. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, it's to the council. Um, perhaps, Mr. Hagmark, if you could answer the gentleman's question about what the process is as much as you... Oh, did you want to, I thought you wanted to talk about Montecito water, which is the next item. Oh, okay. But would, Is that right? Yeah. Thank you. I, I got you, right? You'll be first, I promise. Yeah. I promise. Um, Mr. Hagmark, can you maybe uh, yeah. explain as much as possible about, I guess it sounded like UCSB and the Goleta area and out in there about what their process is about new development and water? Yes, Madam Mayor, uh, council members, uh, the Goleta Water District and the city of Goleta certainly have a, a um, they have a lot more development going on than we do here, but they have issued a moratorium on no new meters, uh, but they still have uh, a lot of projects that are moving forward that already had approval. Uh, they have a completely different water supply situation than the city does. And so, uh, but there is a process, a public process that each one of those projects goes through. And that discussion, I know they're, they're having many discussions at the Goleta Water District and, and city, city Council down there. So um, there's opportunities to weigh in on that. Right. And I think the other complication there is there's two different elected bodies dealing with co connected items. You have the Goleta Water District and then you have the city council that deals with development. And so we are the same body up here when, for both items. So that might make things easier or more difficult. I don't know, but it is, it's different. So. It is different. And they have, um, as Councilmember White said, they, they have a lot of open space where we have a lot of actually, it, this is re redevelopment. And, uh, and certainly there are projects in the city that, that are planning to you know, redo their um, whether it's tearing down and putting new and actually using less water in the end. I mean, there are, those, there are projects that, that have that. They're not every new project is actually increasing its water usage. Great. Thanks. So I hope that answers that question. Uh, Mr. White. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, first of all, Ms. Ha Mr. Hagmar, I've heard this number, and it, was, it, it just kind of blew me away, but I know you, you have it in your head, and that is uh, how much water that the city has to import, and we're, our, our concern is uh, a, a summer away from now. The summer of 2017 is where uh, our, our dear staff is looking over the horizon to, obviously, and in the fear that we've, if, and covering the possibility that we don't get any rain next year either. And that's really the kind of planning that our staff is doing. But we have to import a, some crazy amount of water mm -hmm. in order to have 
uh, a gallon of water. We have to, several gallons of water we have to import in order to have one gallon in the, uh, available uh, a year from August or something like that. Can you go over that statistic for us, please? Madam Mayor, Council Members, uh, we've been talking about the, the implications of how evaporation is accounted for in Kachuma. And again, it's still a, a lively discussion that we continue to have with the Bureau that hasn't been completely settled. But we've made some assumptions on how that could trickle down for us. And basically, wh the way that this discussion is going is there's this, you know, the, the remaining water in the lake. And there are uh, downstream users that have water in the lake. It doesn't evaporate per their contract. And then there's the minimum pool, which doesn't evaporate. So what it does is it leaves any remaining water, which is water that we might import into that lake, has to take the entire evaporation for the lake. And so that's where we've staff has been concerned and focused on it. And one of the things that we're looking at is next summer, typically you have your run, uh, run up of summer water demand. Going into next summer, we need to have built up a roughly five to 700 acre foot surplus in the lake. And in order to build up that surplus of water in the lake so that we can get through next summer, uh, we expect to have about 1,200 acre feet of evaporation on that 700 acre feet of water. So it's almost a 60% tax on bringing water and storing water in the lake. And so certainly that has us very concerned and we're hoping we can work something out that's a little more equitable about how evaporation is treated on the lake. But that has us concerned about being able to meet demands. We have plenty of water. It's just a matter of the limitations on getting it here. We are, we are working with the Central Coast Water Authority who manages the state water imports on... Um, trying to accelerate deliveries so that we can get more water to the lake and and hopefully be able to buffer next year but we still haven't ironed out a plan to do that well and, and madam mayor just that's the kind of planning that our staff is doing and, and, the, and the obstacles and and challenges that they that they have to deal with and yet that's the planning that's going on is for next summer worst case scenario and it, it's a uh, it's a daunting one and i really appreciate staff uh taking that on and, and collaborating with, with this uh, variety of organizations, all with competing interests and, and very smart attorneys on their teams uh, uh, trying to make this uh, work. Uh, and my second question is with the reclaimed uh, water system. It's, can you give us an update of how we're doing there? Are we making any progress on, on getting that pr productivity up? Uh, we, we have been working to bring a, a special filter c uh, consultant on to help us, and he's very optimistic that he can boost production. We have seen in the last week or two we've been getting up closer to a million gallons a day. Uh, previously, we were kind of stuck at 700,000. Uh, we really, the key for us is to get up around 1.5 million to be able to meet demands this summer. Um, I don't want to be too optimistic on this because everything else has been so so uh, drab in this drought. But uh, uh, the consultant seems confident that we can tweak the system and, and try and get some more production. And at this point, we don't know uh, what that's going to be. We're also planning to use the Valverde well, which is a non-potable well, and put that into the system. At this point, we are... Um, we are thinking the shortage, the need for putting potable water in the system is somewhere around two, 200, 250 acre feet uh, to, to kind of take those peaking demand off. Still, it's, it's, a, it's still um, compared to the overall recycled water use. I mean, it's still a big difference from last year and it's still majority of it is recycled. Um, so, um, and thank you for that. Um, just th this is a comment that perhaps Ms. Maria and I would make later, but uh, we had an uh, orientation uh, meeting with, uh, with the CCWA uh, staff, which was fascinating. But the piece that I think is important for this moment is that they are working on uh, re-engineering and uh, looking more closely at our importation system with the hope that we can increase that capacity by 18 percent by, uh, I, I use the term hotter, using hotter pumps. I mean, it's just, it's uh, having mechanical changes. We can't get a bigger pipeline in in that time frame, but they're looking at ways to, to increase the ability to get water into Kachuma Lake. And obviously an 18 percent increase, if we can get anywhere near that, is going to be a, a, over a, the next a year to, to 18 months, uh, could make a, a real difference in, in our supply. So thank you, Madam Mayor. Mr. Hotchkiss. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I may be 
reiterating what Mr. White just asked. I'm not sure, but when you say problems of getting the water here, are those legal problems or 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 physical problems? No, those would be le uh, sorry. Those would be physical problems. And what just are our choices? <laughs> um, well, one of the options that's out there is if other water agencies are not utilizing their full capacity in the pipeline, it automatically gets divvied up to those who want to take advantage of that. And so we have been taking advantage. We've been delivering more water than we have, we have legal capacity for, utilizing others because, for example, Carpinteria has not been making uh, significant state water deliveries, and nor has uh, the Montecito Water District. Um, so we've been taking advantage of that excess capacity to deliver more water for the city. And is now the right time to ask you what difference the, um, as you said, that we have two states instead of one and now regarding water supply. Has the, um, uh, what do I want to say, the, 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 the rain, et cetera, in Northern California, is that affecting us in any way? Or is that going to be helpful or are they, I'm not sure where we go here. Councilmember Hodgkins, I think it's gone a long ways to drive down the price. You saw kind of the general terms of that water purchase. That was a very favorable water purchase. Really, the price per unit was what you'd see almost in non-drought times. I mean, the $250 an acre foot is, is really a, a, a good price. So we, we felt we felt like it was um, the market is much better. I'll right. just say that. The market for buying water is much better. Um, and, yeah, and so now we've, the next critical path is running through the conveyance system. Thank you. Mr. Rouse. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Just more curiosity, thing, Mr. Hagmark, about the supply management, the purchase water from uh, Antelope Valley, and we have for we have to return uh, one acre foot for every two acre feet uh, purchase. What's the default position on that? If, if there's not physical water to return, is there a financial component to that? Is there something in the contract that says, if you don't re return the water, it'll cost you X? Uh, those those terms aren't in there, but certainly there it would end up in mitigation some, or some type of legal dispute. But uh, our current approach would be to pick up hopefully rice water from Northern California and utilize that to make that return. That's our our current thinking on that. But uh, as I mentioned, it's it's quite a at seven thousand acre feet. It's it's quite a debt to be carrying. Not an in lieu fee then that that's been predetermined. No. Okay. Right. No. And that's just to, to clarify, this return water is an interesting component of the state water system. They, they um, DWR put this in the contract, but when you talk to AVEC, they, they really don't need the return water. They, they're, in, they're a community that in the 60s they thought was going to be the next L.A., and so it ended up with a massive Table A state allocation, which they use only a portion of, and so they're just trying to recoup some of their costs. They don't need this necessarily need this water back, but DWR requires there be a return component, and that's something that we're looking with the renewal of the contract that do – is that really still necessary? Do we still need to have this return component? Because it does set up a very um, interesting dynamic in the future. Sounds like Roy Rogers was an influential man in his time. Um, I just want to say that uh, I think the way staff has put together the report does give credit to the public where credit is due. The public has done a fabulous job, absent punitive measures, which, which, which I had faith in from the get-go, and they've certainly performed. The messaging going forward, which has been good so far, is going to have to really include that that entire concept because you know people do ask, well, you know, we did 25 percent, our rates are still going up. What happened to diesel? Now you're asking for 35. So, in a nutshell, when you say a 35 percent target, and as opposed to a ceiling or floor or a threat, is there a way to really put that out to the public that says? You're doing it already. We want to continue doing this. We don't want to do this by cutting in. And as the staff adequately pointed out, along with Mr. Kirkhart, these new developments are, number one, an insignificant amount of water in the big picture. And number two is likely more efficient and, and better serving for the community than the old projects would have been. Um, I suppose, you know, other than just the reports on these council meetings, there's got to be some kind of a an editorial or some kind of description going forward that lets people know we're doing the right things, please continue. I know staff has been good at that so far. If you guys 
consider that at all? Or? No, certainly. We're, we're definitely working on the messaging um, because I think a lot of people are seeing this increase in the target and saying, oh, you want us to do more? And I'm like, I want you to keep doing what you're doing. Whatever you're doing, it's working. Keep doing it. We're, re we're achieving the goal. We're just increasing our target to match what the community is already doing. That's, that's what we're doing here, not, not raising the bar and, and making, asking more of our community, just asking them to continue that same pace. Yeah, because I think typically people expect the governmental agencies to use the hammer as opposed to, you know, a carrot going forward. So I appreciate what you guys are doing. If that messaging can go forward in a real cohesive way, I think that would be really important. I certainly, uh, I don't know about you guys, but I get a lot of questions about that very thing. Is like, what more can we do? And like you said, keep doing what you're doing. So we're good. Mr. Dominguez? I want to... Uh follow up on a comment about newer developments using less water and it uh, kind of makes me think about when I'm out with my friends and family and you walk by a store that says 75% off and so certainly the marginal cost if I were to buy another jacket it's going to be a lot cheaper than the jacket I bought that I only paid 50% off for but what's even cheaper is not buying another jacket and um, adding in more houses as, as efficient as they can be is still gonna increase our water usage. I think there's a, a great benefit. I wanna highlight, I, I wanna certainly encourage that, but I also wanna highlight how much we can save by retrofitting some of our older hardware. And I know there's a lot of people, particularly um, in, in older houses and some of our residents who are most afflicted by economic conditions and environmental conditions, who are really doing well by uh, cutting back on showers, cutting back on how often they flush, cutting back on their gardening. So there's certainly, and, and this goes along with some of the um, complimentary comments that my comments have made and staff have made about our city really doing well. I think people in these older buildings are really doing well cutting back by changing their habits and by sacrificing. It would be great if they could move into newer buildings or retrofit their buildings. And I, and I hope we're doing as much as we can as a city to encourage that because I think that's really where gains can be made. And if you're looking at the bottom line, it's not just adjusting one of the two feeders into that bottom line, but it really ekes out true gains. Um, going back to the slides for the uh, cumulative potential water demand that ends up with a 242 acre feet and the two and a half percent. I was curious if, if we had a number of how many units when we were doing the accounting about how many units that represents of, of development. Well, Mr. Busk looks, I wanted to, to kind of add another tidbit of information related to the general plan and, and our water supply planning. Um, with the potential of 800 acre feet of new demand coming on line, based on improvements, again, in landscaping and in interior um, fixture counts changes or fixture efficiency, we actually, the general plan has us ending in 2035 with less water use than we did going into this drought. Like, we make quite a bit of headway every year with just changing out of dishwashers, changing out of, of, of washers, and uh, we do have um, a model that we have, a water conservation model that helps us determine how much money to spend on different programs. And that model predicts somewhere between 120 acre feet a year of savings just based on the current uh, changes in fixtures, changes in, in uh, appliances. And so you've got to keep that in mind when we talk about 40 acre feet of new demand and 120 acre feet of efficiency that we capture. And so it's still a net reduction uh, at the end of the year in water usage. Madam Mayor and Council Member Dominguez, um, we have 231 units that are under construction. So that would be the building permit issued category. We have 391 units that have been approved and 686 units that are pending. So the numbers up on the screen, however, also include non-residential development. So those are just the housing numbers. I'm sorry, and can you go back to the slide and show me where those numbers fit in just so when I go back and look at this later, I, I don't scratch my hair. So go back to the pipeline projects, maybe the 2014-15. So where would the 231 number go? 
so it would actually go on that slide we were just on. The 231 number would go with the 75.32 acre feet per year, the first row that says building permit issued. Okay. 391 would go with the second row, the 69.64 acre feet. And 686 would go with the 97.5 acre feet. But as I said, the water demand numbers also include non-residential development. And I'm sorry, what was the last number? 686 units are pending, and we have 97.5 acre feet of water pending. And then you said non-residential, or what did... So the, the numbers on the screen, the acre feet per year, you can't um, strictly di divide them by the number of units in the pipeline because the water demand on the screen also includes non-residential development components of projects. Okay. And it's interesting because um, some of these, even the biggest number, 686, correlates to 97 acre feet and 231 correlates to 75. So you have more than twice as many units but only about 20% more water usage. And Council Member Dominguez, that is likely because there's a lot of non-residential development in the pipeline, some bigger projects, um, hotel projects that were mentioned previously, other types of development. And the 2.5% of annual drought water supply, and that's what I was trying to think about in terms of how many more units are we adding into the system? Are we adding in 2% more units, habitable units? or? Mm. And if, if this does continue for the next three or four years, then we're gonna hit 5% of annual supply. And my thinking is if we're gonna add in 5% and the, and the AUD is definitely giving us some, some gangbuster numbers and that may taper off. If we have 10% of our annual drought water supply from this new development and add it into something like say 5% conservation efforts, that's 10%, so that's a, that's a pretty big chunk of, of water. That's a pretty big source of water. And, and going back to your sources of water slide, the projected supply strategy, 10% is, is really a big number then to deal with. So that's all I wanted to point out or make sure I was, I have my numbers all straight at this point. Okay, we do need a motion for this item. I would make that motion, Madam, Madam Mayor. Okay, we're moving the staff recommendation. Okay, uh, by White and second by Rouse. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, that's unanimous. Thank you very much. And we'll get on to item 17.